Today we're on lesson uh, 31. Today we're going to be starting into earthworks. We're moving out of pavement onto earthwork. It's a uh, pretty important piece when we get into design projects. This is one of the larger value items in most of our, our construction projects as far as value um, by cost inside the project. Through there, it's um, pavement would usually is the most expensive piece. It just depends on your situation, right? So in Indiana, where we're pretty flat, the earthwork isn't um, as uh, big, I guess, or as, as large of an item as it could be if you had rolling hills or more mountainous terrain where you had to do a lot of cuts and fills. Uh, through that, earthwork may be more expensive than the pavement. Here in Indiana, uh, earthwork is one of the, the most expensive pieces. Uh, pavement tends to be the, the main one. Uh, through there. Just to give uh, us a little bit of a background and as far as definitions, understand terminology through here. So cut, when we say cut in civil engineering, that's the soil that's being removed. You know, when you take dirt away from the project site, that's cut. Uh, through there, fill is anytime you bring soil in and make an embankment or, or uh, fill something into grade, right? So anytime you have to fill a low spot in, uh, to make uh, make it flat, uh, match your profile grade line, we call that fill. So we have cut and fill. You hear those terms used a lot, All right? So that's uh, the more technical terms uh, for cut would be excavation, and for fills, embankment. And so it's kind of interchangeable. Actually, borrow is also kind of thrown in the mix there as as fill, and it can be a little confusing. That's why I guess we're throwing them up here on this slide. Uh, to get started, right? So borrow is soil that you bring in from off-site to use as fill. So you borrowed it from somewhere else. I don't know that you're ever going to give it back, but we call it borrow. And so borrow is you, you've you brought uh, soil in from some other site. Cut and fill are, um, well, fill can be borrow that you brought in and then used as fill, right, through there. Cut is stuff that's already on site that you need to get out of the way for your project to come through. So if we're doing a road project um, or even a parking lot, right, if we have to remove uh, any soil at all to meet the grades that we want out there, that's cut. And that's so that's on site stuff. Fill is is dirt that's also on site being used to make an embankment, being able to lift the road up all right, through there. And it could be made out of borrow, but it could also be made out of cut that you've moved from somewhere else on the site. And now you're going to use it as fill to to uh, fill in a low spot. Maybe that's why they call it fill. You're filling in a low spot through there. All right. And then finally, a borrow pit is where you got the borrow from. It's where you're borrowing uh, the dirt from. And I don't know that I've ever seen dirt go back to the borrow pit. So it's more like you stole it and not borrowed it. But anyway, um, we call that a borrow pit. So that's where we, we took the dirt from. And uh, usually it's off site. Sometimes it's it's on site, but it's not part of the actual road that you needed. Like you had a little extra right of way you could uh, start a borrow pit in any excess right away you've got uh, through there, haul it over to where the road is it needs it and use it as fill. Then, more more commonly, it's off site. And so, a contractor, if you need borrow on a construction project, contractors normally will go and talk to all the local farmers and uh, anybody near the site and ask them, you know, do you need a pond? <laughs> that's it. I mean, literally, one project we did, that's exactly what they did. They talked to the local adjacent, they try to get it as close as possible. So the, the hauling costs are, are lower, right? So they went to the adjacent landowner and asked him and talked him into building a pond for him. And the landowner was like, sure. Um, so he's got a nice little pond, put a cabin next to it, right? And up there, and you can actually see it from the road <laughs> for now through that. So that's a, a borrow pit. So it, it's up to the contractor to find uh, a place for borrow. Sometimes it's, it's close, sometimes it's not. They have to do soil testing. You got to make sure it's the right kind of material. You can't just use any dirt, right? You need. Uh, quality dirt uh, for this and you've been through the soils class you know what the quality dirt is right we like sandier stuff and things that we can compact well and doesn't have a high uh, percentage of organics in it right so we try to do that and so that's that'll be your borrow pit they have to have all that tested they, they have to have the test results and the gradations from it to show that yes this is a good location for a borrow pit sometimes you you actually go to a commercial pit or a quarry 
and and use their their site because they already may be uh, listed and it's easy to pull the soil out. They already have the equipment there and they can load your trucks and all that. Now they're a commercial uh, operation that may be more expensive than making a deal with a farmer. But so those are our normal terms and you'll kind of interchangeable as well as excavation and embankment uh, through there. But um, you'll you'll hear these a lot uh, today in this lecture going through that. This is uh, to show you that, yeah, this is an actual bid tab from a project. Uh, through there, this is actually the one where the they they built the the pond for the guy on this project, right? So the earthwork, uh, this is the winning bid. This is the main winning bid amount for them. It was two hundred thirty-eight thousand dollars for earthwork, and so that's all of the cut and fill. And the way we did it at the county, we we lumped everything together. And on most in-dot contracts and larger state DOT contracts, you have a separate line for uh, excavation and embankment and borrow, and because we pay. We pay differently for that. Uh, that's really cumbersome in the mess. And so I think they did a good job at the county. It wasn't my idea, but they'd been doing it for a while. They just make it a lump sum, right? Because any number you put on there, the contractor's going to disagree with. This is Earthwork is, is a place where there is a lot of fights, right? So as you become a, a design engineer, and if you're doing inspection, if you're doing construction management, right, get ready because there's always going to be a fight about the earthwork quantities. And they're going to have you go back and uh, re-topo things three or four times because they disagree with your numbers right through there and um, so be ready for it I mean, it's worth a lot of money to them to a contractor and earthwork they they hope to move a lot of earth, earth right early in the project so they want that money and they want all of it uh, early on so that they it it's their uh, cash flow you know, it keeps the project going so that's another reason it, there's a lot of fighting about earthwork it's also um uh, it's so big and it's kind of hard to quantify right uh, because you're everything you're digging out of there or putting in is irregular shaped and and so forth and so there's a lot of room for disagreements about how much there really is right do that so be ready um that will come up and uh, no doubt and then you can actually use drones now that fly over it and kind of doing like aerial survey stuff and you can get um pretty accurate uh, readings on it in a small area like that. And it used to be you had to bring the surveyors out and recross section everything a bunch of times to try to get your earthwork quantity worked out. So so there's a lot of money there. And this is this was all the pavement items down here. Okay, there is, you know, uh, two or three times as much pavement cost in uh, on this project than there was in earthwork. So this earthwork was cheaper. But this is the winning bid, right? The other bidders had more money in earthwork. This guy thought he could save money in earthwork, and so they, that's how they won the bid. Um, is that they they had a lower price. That was one of their uh, one of their areas. They had the best price. They actually had a higher cost in some of the pavements than did the other bidders. But their earthwork cost, if I remember right, it was a hundred or two hundred thousand less than other people, which was enough to win the project for them right through there. So and again, this was the guy who found the farmer right next door. So he thought he could save a lot of money on the borrow cost uh, for this. So that's. Uh, uh, guess a little side note, a little warm up to today's lecture, it may be showing relevance to a degree, <laughs> right? To that, okay. So, how do we calculate earthworks? All right, so this this is going to be a bid item, you're going to be paying for it. Usually, it's by cubic yard or by ton. Uh, through there, I think INDOT typically uses cubic yard for it. How are we going to pay for this, and how do we calculate it? Right? We can't. We can't pay for it unless we know how much it is, and that's how we need to calculate it, right? So what we use is, we call it the average end area method, and this, and if this was our cut section through here, and maybe I'll, I'll get fancy and turn on the pen. Let's see if I can draw any better on the pen than I was uh, through there. So here's, here, this is our road section, right, through here, and come on, draw, there we go. And we can see we can draw. Here's our our total cut for our road. This is along the surface. I don't know why it does that. It does that every now and then. There, all right, through that. And what we do is every so far, in this case, 100 feet, we do a cross section. And so here's that cross section area, right, through that. There's our cross section, all right? And we say, well, in this cross section where it's 634 square feet, up here we do this again. We cross section at this station right all right so you can see we, we've kind of dug this trench in here and we've taken out the soil and now we can come in we can measure right that whole thing and in this at this point 
just if we took this little sliver with this little slice <clears throat> at this hundred feet down the road, it was 600 square feet. <clears throat> we do another little slice, another hundred feet down the road, it's 530 square feet and then 321, right? And so those are the areas, if we were to cut straight across at 100 foot intervals, that's how much area would be in that cross section, right? Through there. And what we do is we say, well, it's 100 feet long. Here's the area on this end. Here's the area on that end. If we average those two numbers together and multiply by this distance, right, that's going to give us a volume, right? And so our volume is going to be those averages uh, through there. So A1 plus a2 um, over 2, and then we multiply it by the length. It shoots up like that um, through there. So that's what that's what it's doing. So that's our average end area. And here's the equation for it, uh, which probably looks better than what I just drew. In fact, I will get rid of what I just drew because that doesn't look very pretty. All right. So here's our um, here's our average end area um, area. Right. So this is the average of one. Um, the, the difference between one and two, right? And so we're taking one half of 634, right? Because that's coming from here. And then here's that 600.5. So that's this guy, right? We're taking half of that. So we're saying, well, we started here, we ended there. The average through this entire length is the average of those two numbers, right? So that's our average area. So it's 617. We take that 617 then, and we multiply it by 100 feet, and that'll give us 61,000 cubic feet, right? So this is the volume. This is the average between 1 to 2. Here's the volume between 1 and 2. And we get this uh, 61,000 and odd uh, cubic feet. Divide by 27, and that will give us cubic yards. And we usually do uh, areas, earthwork, and cubic yards, right? If we were doing metric, we do it in cubic meters. Uh, through there. So we'll often calculate everything uh, usually on plan sheets and your cross sections. This is all by square foot uh, through there. And then in the end, you're reported as a cubic yard. So you do have to do this conversion, right? So that's um, uh, one over um, one over three cubed, right? So that's our, our 27. So, so uh, that gave us the cubic yards out of that. That makes sense. And if we move on, then this is what it looks like in the actual cross sections if you were on a set of design plans, right? So here is the area of cut. Here is the volume of cut. Um, here is the area of fill. And here is the volume of fill, all right? So, okay, well, that sounds weird, right? Why do I have cut and fill, all right? Here's my cut number. Here's my fill number, cut and fill right through there. Well, if you look, here's the existing ground line, right? Here's that existing ground, right? And I still don't know why that shoots up every now. All right, so this area in here, anything between, this is our design elevation that we want to get to, right? This is our new road. Here's our design elevation. Everything in here is cut, right? And stop doing that. Here's our cut. And to the bottom of that design line up to the green dotted line, all of that is cut. And this is still cut right through here. And over here is tons of cut, right? Through all of that. And it says we got two square feet somewhere hidden in here of fill. I think it was like right in here. We're just slightly, um, slightly above. Maybe it was over here. We come up a little bit above, all right? Could be an, uh, an anomaly <laughs> a little bit through there. But you often do, like if our existing ground line was actually dropped like that and stop doing those little jags, right? Through here, we would have to fill this section would be fill, all right? So that would be our fill. We'll double cross hatch it and it still does that weird stuff to me. Okay. So that's, that would be the fill section. Here would be a cut section. It is very common to have both in the same, uh, in the same cross section point, right? And this is at station 149, right? And the station before it was 148.50. And in highway plans, we typically do it every 50 feet. We do stations every 50 feet uh, through there. That last example, I don't know what textbook I found that from, but they were showing 100, probably because they were being lazy. Uh, but your normal cross sections are 50 feet apart in a road project, right? So here's our 50 feet. Here was the one before it, and this was in a cut, a heavy cut section, right? Look at all this. Um, this is all cut, right? Stop that. 
All right, here's all that cut all right, through here. And you can see the A area fill, if you can read that, it says zero. There is no fill. It's all cut. It's like 355 or something. Here's 197, right? So it dropped quite a bit. This is a heavy cut section. And here's our ditches out here. All right, through that. So this is all cut. This one had a little bit of fill in it because we were up um, somewhere. And here, hidden in here, was two uh, square feet. So that's very minimal. It's probably over here at this edge. That's what I'm thinking, right? Um, and so you can see we've moved from... 355 to 197. If we averaged the cut areas and average the fill areas between the two, right, then we could we could calculate the volume of cut and the volume of fill within this 50 feet within between these two stations within 50 feet, right? And well, here it blows it up, right, so we can read it uh, better. I wish I shot up to that one next. Um, so 197 here is at 355, right? We can average these uh, together then and find it. And, and if we look at it, um, you know, ignoring the, the fill, which was probably uh, uh, an anomaly <laughs> there, right? So here was here was our 350 or 335. Here's our 197, all right, through that. And the pen's working pretty well today. I'm going to keep using the pen. All right, so here's our 335 to our 197, right? The fill, okay, that two is really negligible. So let's make that zero, all right? I couldn't see fill in there. Let's knock it off. Through there, what's our average? If we're just averaging these two numbers together, right? So we average those together and we get that. We get 266. Okay, great. Yeah, everyone loves that. All right, through there. And our average of fill should be zero because that's averaging those. We have an average um, area of 266. Through there, we multiply it by 50 feet, right? And our volume of cut uh, turns out to be 133. Um, 13,000, sorry, 13,300, uh, and that's probably cubic feet uh, through that. So uh, if that was, I think that was in in feet, uh, we had to check the settings. This is out of Civil 3D, so whatever you set your settings for uh, through that, it could be square yards or it could be uh, square feet. It's typically square feet, uh, and we could calculate it by hand. All right, so just, and this is nice, right? So this our nice programs these days do all this automatically for us, you know. Back when I was an intern, I spent like an entire month and all I did was use a, a device called a planimeter to measure all those areas and write them in on the cross-section sheets and then do the calculations for the, the uh, uh, earthwork through that. So way better now that the computer does it for you, even if it made a little mistake there. It's still way better now. All right, so that's that would be our volume of cut and pretty sure that's cubic feet at this point right, through there and that's that's what we do right and so this would be what you normally see right here fill this is the fill or embankment right all of this is added in sure right look at that that's all added in through there and cut here's the existing ground right anything be that anything below your design profile that you want for the road is going to be that cut section right through here and this is quite often common right that we're going to have cut and fill through that and this is more of a dramatic hill than most places in indiana but still <laughs> over here we would have fill right and then over here is our cut our section on that so you, you're going to have both and it's fine you know the average engineering method will take care of that even if this is the very next section from that right you're going to transition down to a a um, this is fill. You're going to transition down to a zero fill point and go to all cut, and it automatically works itself out when you use the average end area method. All right, so that's that's how we calculate the quantity right through there. We're going to use this average end area method. This is typically how it's set up. If you show it in uh, sample calc sheet, is you have a line here for one station and that, and line here in between it on a middle line is where you calculate the averages. And so that way you're not confused about does this number belong at 148.50 or down at 149? Well, it belongs to both. It's halfway between. It's the average of those. So that is how we would normally set that up, right? And come through here. The a couple other terms to talk about. We got swell and we have shrinkage, right? So when you excavate soil, when you pull it out of the ground, it plumps up. It gets air in, into it, right? And you can think about it, right? In place, even if it's not been mechanically compacted, it's still fairly dense, right? It's been there for you know thousands of years. It's fairly dense soil. When you pull it out, it is a lot less dense. Well, fair bit dense, less dense. Um, 
and you dump it in trucks, right? You can see it. It's lumpy. It, it crumbles. It's got more air in it. And so that's swell. And so we've, when you pull it out of the ground, it becomes it's a larger volume. You had a hundred cubic yards in the ground. When you pull it out, you may have 110 cubic yards that you're hauling now because it is, there was some swell in there, right? And then when you put it back in place, if you're going to reuse that soil and build your road on top of it, right, you're going to put it in place and you're going to compact it again and compact it in place. And you're, your mechanical compaction will often get it at a, a higher density when you're done than what you started with when it was in the ground when you dug it out. And we call that shrinkage. And so you've you've gone from 100. Um, if we start over here, oh, that dumb thing. If you start over here and you've got 100, stop that, cubic yards, right? You pull it out maybe now. You've got 110, and when you put it back in the ground, right, because you've got shrinkage, now maybe now you only have 90. Oh, dumb thing. All right, so that's that's what we're talking about. So this this part over here is swell. This part over here is shrinkage. All right through there. When you're hauling it in your dump trucks, you're going to need more than 100 cubic yards of of hauling capacity because you had some swell. When it gets back in the ground, it's only going to make up 90 of the yards of fill that you need, and that's shrinkage. And we're going to talk about a lot more about that as we come up. Right, and this is a more of a like a commercial diagram of that. We have one cubic meter, one cubic yard in place. When we pull it out, maybe you've got 25 percent. You know, maybe your swell factor is 25 percent. Sometimes they call that loose yards through there. And then when you put it in, in place and you start rollering, uh, this is a roller, right, in compacting it, uh, maybe you only got 0.9 uh, cubic yards or cubic meters when you're done, right? And that's shrinkage through there. So when you, in, in total, uh, uh, one cubic yard of excavation or of cut is only equal to 0.9 of fill, that you're going to need. And so that's the a shrinkage factor. And we're going to see how that goes. This is a little blurry, but this is kind of showing you what happens as you pull dirt out. So in the bank, this is, means in ground, uh, currently, this is what your your uh, makeup would be, right? And so this is the, uh, if you remember your phase diagram for soil, right? We have air, water, and soil in there. And as we, as we dig it out, the soil and the water probably remain almost the same, but the air uh, volume shoots up. And so that's kind of a loose uh, soil, right, as we're transporting it. So you've had um, you've had the swell, and it comes up to here, and now you're going to have some shrinkage. When you compact it, mechanically compact it, you, you take a lot of the air out. You may actually take a little more of the water out, too, than you did before. And often, moving the soil and digging it out and all that, you'll lose some water content. If nothing else, it aerates it uh, for a bit. All right through there and then you put it back in place and mechanically you may squeeze a little more water out too and to get good compaction you remember one of the ways to get good compaction is we add some water to get to that uh, that maximum density that we want right remember we calculated in soils class how to cal calculate the maximum density of soil uh, through there and so you're you're adding water and you're using rollers or whatever other kind of compaction equipment you've got sheep's foot what you know whatnot and so you'll actually uh, lower the the total volume of the soil right as far as uh, the mass of physical uh, soil particles they're the same they haven't changed it's the air and the water contents that have changed right through that here's some some typical soil conversion factors right through there in the if you had one cubic yard in the bank in the ground to start with You'll be in place before you excavated it. And then, um, I'm going to turn that, that pen off. And then when you pull it out, it may swell up to 1.27, right? So you got a little bit more than a 25% increase <coughs> in your the volume you're moving. By the time you get it compacted back in, you're down like 0.9 right, through there. So one cubic yard in the ground of clay is only going to after you compact it is worth 0.9 cubic yards of fill so you've you haven't lost any material it's just it's it's denser right it's more dense now and so you've got 0.9 of it 
Right. And you can see it's fairly similar for common earth is about the same range right through there. Sand, you don't get quite as much uh, compaction difference, right? Sand is fairly well compacted already uh, through that. It doesn't swell as much either. And when you finally compact it, you don't have as much uh, shrinkage either. Now, the interesting one is, is rock. And you can see this, right? A cubic yard of rock, once you blast it out of there, it's, it, it, its volume shoots up by 50%. You got one and a half cubic yards now. And then when you try to compact rock back in, right, you've only got uh, one, you have 1.3 cubic yards, right? Start of one yard, you're at 1.3. Well, yeah, once you've, you've shot uh, blasted rock and it's all falling apart, you're never going to get it back as tight as it was when it was a rock, <laughs> right? It was all like a solid rock face, right? Now it's, now it's like an aggregate. Now it's more like uh, crushed stone, right? You're never going to get that all back together in a perfect, uh, in the perfect same density as, as the original rock, right? Unless it's, unless you dump it in a volcano, I guess, and then make new rock out of it uh, for that. So that's an interesting one right there. In Indiana, we don't have to worry much about that. Uh, maybe in Southern Indiana, we blast rock down then in limestone areas through that. Here in Northern Indiana, you're not going to have to worry about this one, right? You're going to be running into mostly clay and common earth uh, up here uh, in Northern Indiana through that. And, and sometimes our, you know, terminology, we say our bank volume is V sub B, right? So that's our bank volume in cubic yards. And then you have a density B, so in pounds per, per bank at cubic yard. And that's in place. This was all the original stuff before you dug it out. When it's loose, this is when it's in a dump truck, right? You're hauling it around. We call it a loose cubic yard. And here's our density, uh, we sometimes call it L. And the compacted once it's back in the ground and you're putting it where you want it and you're compacted in place, um, you use this term uh, V sub C for a compacted volume through there. And then we have a density of C uh, as that point. So if you wanted to get technical about it and track things through, that's the terminology we'll use for that uh, through there. All right. So our, and then our shrinkage. And so we're in a normal project, right, we we don't want to haul dirt on or off site if we can help it because it's expensive, right? If you can move stuff on site where your road project is and keep it on site, or even if you're building a building, if you can keep the dirt on site, it saves you a ton of money, right? And the contractor, they're smart. You know, anytime they can find a place to either borrow um, dirt or leave dirt, <laughs> excess dirt, at the end of the project, not have to haul it on or off site, they will. And they'll come to you and they'll, they'll ask and see if they can uh, work out a deal like that. Often they'll give you a price uh, cut <laughs> if you'll let them store the excess material on site or, or use uh, or create a borrow pit on site right, through there. And uh, it's up, I guess, it depends on the, each project whether that's going to be allowed or not. It's kind of up to the owner at that point. And, and so the, the common practice is if you've got cut, if you're removing soil somewhere on site, you're going to look for a place on site to use it, particularly if you have another section that needs fill, you're going to just move it down. And even if you have to haul it on site, it's still super, uh, much cheaper, not super cheaper, much cheaper than hauling from off site and doing a borrow pit. All right, so you're going to do that. So we're going to reuse this as much as possible if it's suitable material. We'll talk a little more about that coming up too. And just keep in mind that once you dig it out of the ground and uh, one part of the project, its volume has increased and now you have to haul extra volume. So that's that swell piece, right? And then you put it back in the ground. It's going to, it's going to compact and that's our shrinkage factor right through there. And all those things vary by soil type. We just saw those and that shrinkage factors, you know, we're at 1.1 to 1.25 in high fills and 1.2 to 1.25 on low fill sections, right? Um, and through there, you get a little bit more in high fills because you get uh, more compaction uh, through there. I guess it'd be that one through there. So there's a little bit of difference in the range. INDOT tends to use just 25% just across the board through that, unless your soils report tells you different uh, through there. And so that's how much material we've got that we're going to need for fill. This is going to affect that and how we do that. Right. And excavated rock swell, we've got lots. If you had excavated rock, it's going to... Uh, one cubic yard of excavated rock, you're going to end up with 30% more than, than you started with All right, through there. So that's that's a definite swell factor. This is how we normally lay it out. This is a, kind of an in-dot style. I'm not sure what other states do, but here's how in-dot 
lays out their earthwork summary table. So on your set of plans for the contractor before they do their bid, they're going to look at this and you're going to give them an estimate of how much uh, fill and borrow and common X there may be on the project site so they can bid it. And then these items, these line items, the fill and common X and any borrow you had actually show up as a bid item in the, excuse me, in the bid tab as well. And, but on the sheets, you show the summary and they should match. These numbers should match or you're going to hear about it, right? Through there. And what you're saying is throughout the entire project, I need 617 cubic yards of fill. And this is a plan, this is a plan quantity of fill. And that's, uh, go back to drawing here, right? Um, so if this, this was our existing ground, right? And we, we have our, dang on it, stop that. I think everywhere I go now, it's going to do that. Um, and what causes that? Does anybody know? The, um, I'll tell you what, it is driving me nuts. So we're going to start over. Is it because my finger hits the, I don't know. So here, ah, stop that. And now you are crazy. I'm going to go back to pen, pen mode. Sorry, we're way off, right? Um, so here is our new road, right? And maybe this was, I think it is. If I drag my finger across, it puts those little jags in there. So I got to be careful. All right, so this is our new road, right? This is all fill. This is all that fill. And, and what we're saying is looking at the plan sheet, if you were to measure this off the plan sheet, this, ah, I did not touch it that time. This is 617 um, cubic feet. Dang, go on, stop it. Um, that's 617 cubic feet that we need, and that's a planned quantity of fill. Right. But we know that if we were digging uh, over here, let's say, here's the existing ground, and over here we had a cut, stag gone. We had a cut section like that, right? Through there, here's cut. I'll use that cross half measure. No, oh, that thing just. Not me touching it. Um, all right. So that's, if we had that, right? So we're hauling it out of here. We're, this is cut. Right, through there. We're hauling this out of here, put it in trucks, and we're dumping it here, and we're making an embankment. So we're using it as fill. I need, from the plan sheet, I need 617 cubic feet of fill over here. Right. When I cut this out, right, am I cutting out 617 cubic feet? Mm, no, I'm not. I'm cutting out, I need 771 over here. Oh, that thing just drives me nuts. Okay, I need 771 because I'm my compaction is so good. It's going to be more dense when I'm done than it was when I when it was fresh ground. I just dug out of, out of the soil right off the site. So if I haul 771 cubic yards of this out, drive it over here and dump it, then with compaction, I end up with 617 cubic yards of fill over here. So that's what this shrinkage is showing you, right? And so this is what, so the total fill volume that I need to actually excavate somewhere, you know, on site most likely, if I can help it, I need 771 to end up with the six, 617 that I really wanted up here. All right, through that. And then I then the next thing we look at is over the total uh, project site, how much common X do we have, which is cut, All right? And so this is also, oh, that thing, is also cut All right through here. So over the total project site, you know, and this is, Kind of not uncommon. We have a lot of common X. You know, this is how much common X I've got. And then we have unsuitable. What's that mean, right? What's this? What is, what is this? Oh, that thing. All right. What is unsuitable uh, common X? What's that mean? And, and this is exactly what it says. This is soil that you can't use as fill. And so it could be uh, a peat. It could be peat. It could be a marl a deposit. Could be high organics. It could be topsoil. We don't want topsoil in there. So we're going to remove. We're going to say some some percentage of all the dirt we have to cut out of the project over here in this cut section. Right? Isn't we we can't reuse it. We can't use it for fill because it's not suitable. And that's this guy. 
And there's different ways to calculate that. If, you're, if your common X includes uh, topsoil, which it normally does, right, you have to estimate how much topsoil you have, right? It's typically six to eight inches of topsoil times the footprint of your road. That's all unsuitable. You're not, you can't reuse topsoil in fill because it's, it's, uh, it's got too high of organics and it won't structurally hold up, right? through there. You may have some really nasty clay. You can't reuse that. You're not going to make a uh, film out of that nasty, sloppy clay right through there. Some clay you can, uh, but others you can't. Your soils report should give you an idea how much unsuitable you've got. So that's this. This is how much excess material I've got. I had to cut all this out. This is how much excess material I've got. I can't use this portion of it though. Too bad. I'm left with this. I'm left with this much of good usable uh, common excavation. Well, out of all that that I hauled out of here, I need 771 to make my fill mound over here, which isn't very big apparently compared to the rest of it, right? And so in the end, at the end of the day, excess excavation, oh, that thing, that excess excavation is, this is how much dirt the contractor hauls off, has to haul off site. That's how much extra common X that, uh, that we have, we couldn't reuse as fill anywhere on site. We could only reuse 771 of this on site. Once we compact it, it's actually only 617 once it's been recompacted. All right. So that's, and this is, this is the number that the contractor has to calculate. Okay. I need to find a place to dump uh, 2,900 cubic feet of soil somewhere. Right, this has to go somewhere. So I need to find the farmer who wants a mound, <laughs> maybe a hill to ski on, or I've got to take it somewhere else uh, and find a use for it. Right through there. So this is our earthwork summary. <coughs> what the contractor knows then in the end is, all right, then now they know how much fill they're going to, how much of the soil they're going to haul out and it's useful, how much they can reuse on site and how much has to leave site. That's where we end up on that all right so some some notes on earthwork uh, as we look at this all right um if you don't want to if if you can fine tune your design right contractors love it if they don't have to pick the dirt up and haul it somewhere and dump it back out again right why have all those dump trucks on site when you don't need them you can uh, effectively push dirt about 500 feet that's not that far right so um, if you're getting much more than 500 feet, it's still probably going to be better. You're going to use a scraper or you're going to uh, put it in dump trucks and haul it and redump it out again through there. And it's quite often is more than 500. But if you've got small hills and you can, um, you can push things over and, and dump it, that's about the effective distance uh, efficiently that a dump, a, uh, sorry, a dozer can, can push. And so if, if here's my, my project is as a tree, apparently, um, through here. And here is my design profile right, through that. All right, I can, if this is within 500 feet of this fill area, here's my cut, here's my fill, right? I'm going to haul, I'm going to cut all that off, and I am going to dump it into here and and use it as fill in there. If this is within 500 feet, if it tops, cut the top of that hill off, dump it in this valley, right? Within 500 feet, I'm just going to use dozers to do it, right? If I'm over a thousand feet, okay, that's getting pretty far. I may have to put it into an off-road truck or something who can haul a bunch and dump it in all at once. Or I'm going to, uh, if it's even further, we may have to go on-road. I'll use standard dump trucks for that. So just keep that in mind. Yeah, If you can balance the earthwork within 500, maybe 700 feet, um, the contractor will love you because they can save money and you're going to save money uh, for your, the owner of the project um, and keep it going like that. So the bulldozer can do it itself. All right. Just keep that in mind through there. The, the other thing to keep in mind is a big thing. You're going to hear this all the time is, did you balance your earthwork? Did you balance the cut and the fill? All right. If you go back to this guy, all right, we would love it if we had, um, if we needed 2,951 cubic feet of fill and we had 2,951 feet of cut, bingo, man, that is bonus. All of the dirt on site stays on site. It's all being reused, except for this little bit of unsuitable. We had to throw that away uh, and probably plant grass on it. We just use it as uh, fill on the side and a little berm. But if we could balance the, the total fill needed with the excess excavation, oh, man, that is awesome. Yeah, ideally, this would be zero down here. 
right and it, all the the excess uh this 37 3722 would be what we needed for fill i guess it should have said that and then this number would be zero we have no excess excavation and we have no bar we had to bring in from offsite okay that'll be awesome and you're going to get asked this. Um, uh, I've heard it as a question in senior design. Did you balance your, your earthwork? And, and for the first time I heard someone get asked that, it wasn't by me. Um, I'm thinking to myself, you know what? I have never in my life balanced the earthwork on any project I've ever worked on. So sorry, I, this, is, this is Jay's version. Um, balancing earthwork is a dream. <laughs> right? yeah, I like that. I'll use the mouse. That's a dream. All right, this is a dream. The, the, what it comes down to is very rarely do we anymore. Okay, when you, when you built the original interstates, okay, maybe they were balancing earthwork fairly well. <clears throat> I still doubt it, but they might have been because you're going through open ground, right? You're going through fields. There's, uh, you're not tying into anything. It's all new design. It's, uh, it's whatever you want. You just dreamed up in your head. You can build it. Yeah, you're kind of out there. And you can balance the earthwork then, right? That In that case, yeah, maybe. Maybe you can balance your earthwork. And you that's the best chance you're gonna ever going to have for it, right? That's rare anymore. How often do we build interstates now, right? Indiana built one in the last 20 years. <laughs> so uh, brand new and a brand new alignment. They've built one, actually it's probably in the last 30 years, they've built one um, between Evansville and, and Bloomington. And that's the only brand new stretch I know of, of interstate, All right? Totally through there. I think you'll get some smaller roads, okay? Yeah, the county has done one maybe off line road that's brand new through there. Maybe the earthwork was fairly balanced on that. What I'm saying is quite often, that's not the biggest problem, right? You're, you have a lot of constraints. Normally, you're reconstructing a road that's already there. There's already houses there. There's already driveways, right? You can't balance the earthwork if you screw up everybody's driveway, right? You are going to get fired. So you have to tie in all those driveways, and you've got to make it work uh, through there. And if you can you know, do what you can to try to balance or work as close as you can. Great. But that is not the most important thing, right? So matching driveways, matching bridge elevations, reducing right-of-way impacts. We don't want huge cuts and fills in, in certain places because we want to try to keep uh, the road as tight as possible, the right-of-way lines, right? So we don't have to buy as much right-of-way through there. And drainage is a huge thing, right? It doesn't matter uh, about balanced earthwork. If you needed more ditches, but you didn't want to cut more ditches because it was throwing your earthwork quantity off, right? No, you better dig those ditches. Right? You can't get away from that. You know, the drainage is your number one thing, remember? If that doesn't work, nothing works <coughs> through there. So in, you know, 85 to 90% of any project you do, balancing the earthwork is not the big deal, right? It's a lot of other things. And yes, if if you can meet these other constraints and then balance earthwork, great. That you, They will love you if you can do that All right, through there. Um, saves everybody money. Contractors are happy. Owners are happy. Everyone saves money right, through that. But it's, again, it is often not, not the, uh, A, there's may be no way to do it without a major mess uh, through there. Right? In, in a city environment, you're almost always going to have excess uh, cut right through there because you want to keep the road lower than the houses around it so the water drains to it. If you if you shed water off your road into someone's front yard, you are in trouble, right? The Whoever you're working for are going to get a lot of phone calls and you're going to have to come back and fix it, right? So you keep your road lower in, in an urban environment so that the water drains to it, goes into your storm drains, and you haul it away right, through there. They will love you if they used to have a wet yard and now you've your road's a little bit lower than it was and you're, you're able to drain their yard for them. Uh, okay, that's a good thing. And out in the country, you want your road higher than the existing ground. Same reason. You don't want it to flood out there. So there you've got ditches, and it's more likely you're going to balance the earthwork out there uh, closely. But in the rural environment, you're going to be higher than grade. And just look at any interstate, uh, any major US-30. Um, look where that road sits versus the round, ground around it. It's almost always higher, right, in a 
it's a typical northern Indiana area where we're flat. It is higher. So they weren't balancing their earthwork, guaranteed. There were borrow pits in places to build that road up because they wanted to keep it above the 100-year flood line. They wanted to, just for a lot of reasons, they wanted to stay a little bit higher uh, through there. So that's that's my uh, diatribe on balanced earthwork. Yes, it is a great concept. Have I seen it happen? Uh, maybe once. <laughs> we'll say that. All right. But you're going to get asked. Someone's always going to ask you, did you balance your earthwork? Well, is it the most important issue? Is it the most important criteria? It's great, but it may not be the most important. It rarely, in my experience, has been the most important. In fact, I'd where I hate to admit it, I don't know they even ever even really pay attention <laughs> to, to the earthwork. It has never been, I've never had that luxury, right, of of worrying about, and did I balance the earthwork? And there was so much else going on. The earthwork is what the earthwork it was, right? And this is where we ended up. This some um, uh, ideas, is, again, for earthwork, what we're talking about in equipment. This is a scraper, right? Uh, for longer hauls, they can do the excavation in common X through that. The dirt flows up here and gets held into the uh, the body of the scraper. The scraper can lift all this up. This pivots here, right? The scraper will well pivot up. This this uh, the scraper pan they call it is now up off the ground. This uh, the scraper as a whole drives down the road and it can go um, fairly far. You know, thousands of feet. Uh, before they'll dump it. Sometimes they put it in, if they're storing like topsoil, they'll scrape that off, make a great big mound, just leave it there until the end of the project, until they find a place for it. If you're doing uh, cut, if this is structural soil that you can reuse as fill, they'll haul it down to where you're filling and then a bulldozer will place it and then you roll it uh, typically through there. All right, so that's a scraper. Off-road dump trucks, these are about 20 cubic yards of soil. Um, I've been on projects where they drove them on the roads too. I'm not sure it was legal. Well, I know it's not. But no one arrested them because they're working for the county, right? <coughs> for that. And these suckers can move. I mean, they were going like 60 miles an hour. You don't want to be passed by or going the other direction when this one of these comes by. He's taking up the whole county road. They're really wide, right? So they're typically are not supposed to be driven on, on standard public roads, but you can. Uh, through there, they're because they hold 20 cubic yards, they're a lot more efficient uh, on larger earthwork projects. And usually, it's in conjunction, you'll see them near the scrapers and all that. And so, if you have to haul it out, they use an excavator to fill these, they drive down, dump it, then a bulldozer will place it for you. And then, uh, dump trucks this is a standard on road dump truck, you can expect about 10 cubic yards uh, filled in here right now remember when you hauled out of the ground it was it was probably nine cubic yards you put it in a truck it's 10 because it, it fluffed up and then when you place it it's going to be eight cubic yards when you get it back in there but a standard truck you can expect about 10 cubic yards right so if you look at this if we jump back to this project we're hauling 2951 cubic feet well, this is cubic feet off the project um, we divide that by 27 what does that what does that give us um, I'll get my calculator on here. 29.51 divided by 27. Um, that's about 109 uh, cubic yards of excess, so 10 trucks. So that's that's why we're talking about this. They'll take about 10 of these trucks to haul off. Okay, that's a really small project. That's good. No, that's not very many trucks at all. You know, larger projects, uh, you can easily have, you're moving, um, you know, 30 or 40,000 cubic yards, either in borrow or in cut going off site. So that's a lot of, that's a lot of hauling. That's a lot of cost uh, to the contractor. So that's, that's earthwork. Um, just say a, a light touch, I guess, in earthwork, not super heavy duty into it, but hopefully you understand how we do the numbers. So, uh, we have some exercises coming up uh, you can get practicing on.